How's that? Huh? Can you hear that now? Much better. Yes. All right. For those of those those that have to file taxes and maybe have to pay taxes, uh, I did a I did a prelim phone call to the franchise tax board because I had heard okay through certain medias that taxes weren't due until October, even for those who do quarterly payments. And I actually called the franchise tax board. They had heard me. No penalties. You don't even have to file for an extension. So for any of those who have to file and you have to pay taxes quarterly, um, just be assured there's supposed to be no penalties. But call the IRS too if you're worried about your uh, 1040 and all your schedules. All right, let's open in prayer. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for each one of these people who are represented here, Lord, their businesses and their families, Lord. I just lift them up to you and bless them, Lord. I pray for those that are infirm and that can't attend here, Lord. I just pray that you have miracles abounding in each one of their lives. Thank you for Skyline Church allowing us to have this great venue. And for those that come and find us here, Lord, in our little corner of the world, I pray that they're blessed. And that your wisdom shines through. And I pray for our speaker this morning. He's going to share some insight and in his real estate knowledge. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay, we're going to have Herbert come up first, I think. Herbert's going to do a little mini infomercial uh, on his enterprise. Good. 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 Thank you for the invite, Carlos. I uh, met Carlos at the Colby Swap Meet yesterday. Uh, we're out uh, passing out flyers for our one day hiring event at uh, San Diego City College. Uh, we, I'm a representative, I'm a representative for the Carpenter Dreams, uh, Local 619, which is in San Diego. And uh, we're going to have a one day hiring event. We're going to have contractors on the site uh, hiring people on the spot. So it's for men and women. And uh, all they need is to have a good attitude, have a little depth in their step. And uh, have some boots, jeans. We're gonna provide the hard hat, glasses, gloves, and uh, basically just trying to give people an uh, opportunity to our four, uh, four year apprenticeship program, which is earn while you learn. And uh, like I said, the starting pay is uh, $22.15. Whoa! 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 And, uh, and dental benefit. Uh, and that also includes the $5 per hour uh, vacation. So, say for instance, uh, they start April, any hours that they work from April to August, say for instance, they work a thousand hours. They get a thousand times five, five thousand dollars paid out of using the bird for the vacation. Whoa. Yes, sir. Uh, like I said, it's earned while you burn. So, most of the hours are, are working hours, it's done on the job site. So, they work. For three months, then they go to our apprenticeship for one week. And that one week, they'll get their OSHA 10, they'll find out about uh, fall protection, uh, first day CPR, and then they'll go back to the job site for three more months. And when they come back to school for that second time, they get a $5 raise. Wow. So for every six months, they get a $5 raise, and it goes up. I think it's earning it in San Diego right now, it's currently making $45 an hour. Wow. So wow. if anybody has any questions or would like to uh, invite people out to our one day hiring event, they have an opportunity at it. It's changed my life. It got me uh, more stable, been able to provide for my family, and because uh, we're talking about the benefits, contractor pays the benefits for the, for your family. So, you have any flyers? I have plenty of flyers on the crowd. Thank, Thank you guys you. for your time. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. <clears throat> when is the event? Uh, it's uh, April 22nd at 6 o'clock. Thank you. Ready? Yeah. So you guys uh, take people in their fifties, Herbert? Anybody, no, no, age, uh, no age discrimination. Uh, we have, even if you're not just a carpenter, we got positions called uh, project engineer, this is project manager, uh, project manager, superintendent, engineer, retailer, uh, operator. Yeah, no, no, hey, I'm not mm -hmm. yeah, no. That's awesome, Harvard. Mm -hmm. 
I'm going to start a little bit more. Let's just go ahead and roll down. Um, my name is Jack Brown, the realtor. Hello, sir. Like this? Yes, sir. Okay. Jack Brown, the realtor with Keller Williams. Um, been licensed since 99 and broker since 2004. Um, when I first started, I was just thinking about this the other day. The MLS just came out on the internet. It was a brand new thing. You don't have to carry around those big books or anything like that. So anyway, I've been doing this for a really long time. Uh, today, lucky you guys, we're going to talk about the most exciting part of real estate, which is the contract. Okay, so this is the residential purchase agreement. Um, this is, and this is the California Association of Realtors form. You can do it on another form. This is what realtors use. Um, and so, David, the buyer, the property address, here's where the parcel number goes. Um, we're going to, uh, the agency disclosure, that comes separately, but it, it references it here. That says that the realtor, me, has to be honest with you. If we get a bad offer, I got to still show it to you. If the buyers are trying to back out, I got to tell you about it. Says you got to do the same thing with me. If your house gets hit with lightning, I got to know. If there's a lien on your property that you're trying to hide, you got to tell me. Um, so it's a back and forth. You have to, and you call that a fiduciary duty that I have. So I have to be professional, I have to be honest. Um, Okay, now this is where you list where the listing broker would be me or the buyer's broker me um, or a dual agent. And that's what they call a double A ending it um, when a realtor handles both the buyer and the seller. Now, be careful on these when you accept this if you're a seller in this situation um, because. The, the agent is going to make more money. So there are some agents that are greedy and that are going to try to push those offers through. And sometimes it's happened many times where they hide the uh, offer that's going to make you more money because they want a bigger commission. Um, there's other agents that are just weak and or dumb, and they will get talked into this by a savvy buyer. Okay, so, oh, no, it's the best situation for them because I'm going to close this and that. So be aware of the dual agency. I do like probably a couple a year, um, but it's always got to be mathematically better for the seller. Um, it's all, you know, the buyer is approaching you. Either they, sometimes they just don't have an agent. That's that's where we move. But sometimes they're trying to sweeten the pot. And so make sure that the realtor is sending you all the offers. Um, potentially competing offers. This is saying if you're the buyer, David, hey, I am going to represent you in this offer, but I can represent other buyers also. And so you see that happen plenty of times. Here's an offer from Joe Blow, Agent Joe Blow. Here's another offer from Agent Joe Blow, different buyers. They're allowed to do that. Um, so don't get mad at your uh, buyer's agent for doing that if you write a good offer. Um, same thing with the listing agent. He's allowed to take a listing around the corner. Um, right. So just in this scenario, we put a million dollar house. Um, we mark that box up there if it's all cash. That happens plenty nowadays. Close of escrow, I put in 30 days. That's a very typical escrow time. But I've seen them as low as seven days, and I've seen them as low as almost a year back in the short sale days when they were. Doing. I did nine days. You did a nine day? Oh, okay. I thought you were telling me I only had nine days. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Uh, yeah, see, um, and that can happen. Uh, they can, um, if it's all cash, that's easier. Sometimes if you have uh, all your ducks in a row, your lender can move faster. Um, your deposit, um, I put in here ten thousand dollars. That's a one percent of, of the purchase price, and uh, that's a typical amount. 
uh, 1% of the price is kind of the rule of thumb. Sometimes uh, buyers don't have it. You see this a lot of times with military family, uh, sergeant and a staff sergeant, a married couple, and they got five kids. They don't have any cash money, but they make good income. So they might, might be able to buy this house, um, but, but their deposit is going to be pretty low. You just want to check what the reasons are. Have your agent call the other agent, make sure he understands what's going on. Um, and also make sure that he talks to the lender. Here in this scenario, we have an $800,000 loan, which is 8% of the purchase price, which means it's a 20% down loan, 20% of the down payment. All right. That's usually a conventional loan. You would mark one of these boxes over here if it's FHA, VA, or even seller financing is becoming a lot more popular now because of the higher interest rates. Um, a lot of landlords are going this way because it's already a drag to get somebody a tenant out if you don't want them there. So in the center carry, you still have an income. Your capital gains gets kicked down the road. You know, you don't have to get hit with that right away. Um, and now you're the bank. So if there's a leaky roof, as a landlord, you got to fix a leaky roof. As a bank, you say, hey, no, that's your house. And so a lot of people are like in that scenario nowadays. Um, additional financing, that's if there's a second loan. You don't see those as much in one house. Those, those are very popular back in OA part of the destruction of yeah. the real estate world. And they were doing liar, liar loans and all that. So you take the deposit, add it to the loan amount, add it to the down payment, should come up with the purchase price. If it doesn't, come out of the loan. Okay, here's something to always pay attention to. This didn't used to be there in the older contract. When I say older, I mean this last year. Uh, they used to have to write it out in the situation. Now it's just a, a little more box, more, uh, check box. We put the amount in. So in this scenario, they're asking for 2% seller credit. And that means that the seller is through their proceeds going to credit it back the buyer um, money for either their the closing cost, or maybe they buy down their um, interest rate, which is, you know, with the interest rates right now, that's a very popular thing. If you write an offer like this, be aware that your offer is $20,000 bigger now. You didn't write a million dollar offer, and now you wrote a 980. Um, By the way, that's unusual. I mean, can, can, you, can you go into it a little bit? Is that normal? That's very normal. Um, that's I, I did that with my house. We, we asked for 2% to cover our clothing costs. And I had a VA loan, so I got in there with actually no money until we started redecorating and things like that. Um, but yeah. <laughs> that was a laugh moment. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the sympathy laugh. Um, but yeah, that's very common because a lot of people um, either need help or want help. Um, I just didn't, I was just doing the deal. I didn't want to come out of my pocket for anything. Um, and the seller liked our offer. They liked, you know, the income. They liked the pre approval letter. They liked everything. And they said, okay, we'll give you that. And so um, I put it towards my closing cost. And then there was a little bit of money left over. So I bought extra year worth of buyer's home warranty. And so uh, those are things you can do. You can't get the money back in your pocket like in the old days. That used to be a big thing. It used to be, okay, we'll give you a million dollar offer. We want a $200,000 credit back. And, it's, and that they used to get away with things like that and then just walk away from the house. But that's, uh, that doesn't happen anymore. Yeah. So now what a lot of people do now in this scenario um, is write an offer for a million twenty because then the seller will get to credit or get their profit the amount he was going to. Now that weakens your offer appraisal wise because the higher the offer, 
the less likely it is going to pass a appraisal. Just naturally, you know, higher prices. Um, and appraisers are wrong so much. Um, they are the four letter word in real estate. Um, and so that's that's a scenario that you have to do now if, if you might need it. And so don't be a, don't be scared to write those offers. Just know that your offer is weaker and it might take you a couple of offers, a few offers, a bunch of offers before something sticks to get your house. Okay. Verification of all cash offers, verification of down payment closing costs, verification of loan application. Buyers have this ready before you even go looking for a house. The, one, the worst thing in the world is you find your house that you fall in love with and you're not ready. And you write an offer and you're not taken seriously because you don't have your ducks in a row. Um, and on the seller side, yes, sir. What? How do you verify a bank, what, a bank statement? Bank statement, well, however they're holding their money. And it might be several bank statements. It could be a, um, a retirement fund. It could be a lot of things. So you need that type of statement to yeah. get to the real estate agent so they can say, oh, okay, we got to verify our funds. Yep, and the best thing is to send that in with your offer. That would be approval letter, all that. So you you know, so it's like dating someone. You show up with the relatives, <laughs> you don't show up, you know, you don't show up like a crazy person. Um none of that all together because buyer, what you're trying to do is you're selling yourself to the seller. You're trying to hey, we are the people that you want to marry. We're going to finish this deal with you. You're going to get your money from us. We're not going to be a hassle. So try to show them that up front. Um, sellers, don't accept an offer until you have these things. Don't accept an offer. They could tap dance and do all that's coming and this and that. Bring it. I'm not going to sign the contract until you do show me that because, yeah, it's. You don't want to have to cancel on somebody and start again because it it hurts if like especially if you come off the market now everybody's going to say why did you come off the market you know a little red flag to other buyers um and that thing it just hurts emotionally to start and stop and say it's a very emotional process yes See should the real estate agent tell us that i mean shouldn't they Absolutely. So, because we don't know what not to know. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what I do with my folks. So, you do that? Yes. I'm telling people this to make sure that if you have another, if you cheat on me with another realtor, I'll forgive you. <laughs> However, <laughs> make sure that they're doing the proper things. Um, yes. Um, what do people that would like to buy? Low income. How do they do it? That's that's tough, man, because that's what the loans go on is your debt to income ratio. Um, first off, you could do though is get rid of any debt you can, um, and then try to get your income up as much as possible. Some, you know, on a proper mortgage might be harder to get than maybe a seller carry. Because then a seller carry, now you're talking to the seller can give you any terms he wants. Banks, mortgage companies, things like that, they're handcuffed to a certain criteria. And if you meet that, great. If you don't meet that, then you're kind of in a stuck situation. Kevin. What percentage of uh, offers are you seeing where uh, sales where the seller is carrying? Is that common in this market now? Or what would be a favorable market for a seller? This is a kind of market when the interest rates are up higher than people like, um, because then people can get in there. And a seller carry would usually be uh, interest only for, you know, you can chop it up any way you want. But what's common is a, is a interest only. So say it's $700,000 house, you put down $100,000, uh, which would be non-refundable. And then you have six hundred thousand dollars worth of loan and interest only, so your payment will be a lot less. 
and that'll usually be three, four, five, maybe even ten years, something like that. And then a balloon payment at the very end to be paid all along. So we'll the, refinance with you. The benefit to the seller in that is that they get a higher purchase price because you can afford a, a, a higher payment. Higher purchase price, absolutely. Um, there's more people willing to do that when I advertise something as a seller carry or people come out of woodworks. A lot of investors really are attracted to that because they can get in there easier, less expensive, then they can rent it out and do whatever. What is normally the interest rate now? What is the normal interest rate that a seller would charge roughly? There's no I mean, roughly. Well, I'll give some examples. I had one going uh, last year where the seller wanted six, and I didn't tell the buyer that they came in at eight. Um, I got one now out in Boulevard, uh, which is you, you haven't been to that metropolis. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, where the guy wants 12%, and he only wants 10% down. And so that's a, yeah, it's a, it's a higher thing. Interest only, though, so it's it'll still be less than a lot of regular mortgages. I mean, that's what he wants. You know, if you're a buyer and you know, the seller says this, counter that. You know, say, you know, negotiate. That most things are um, acceptable. Sure. On the advantages of the, sell, the, the seller carry that I like to emphasize, the first of all, the capital gains, they hold that back. The other one is if the seller sells the, the property and he has, let's say, $200,000 that he puts in the bank, the bank's going to pay one two percent interest. If he has to sell the buyer pay him, that interest can be a lot more than 2%. It could be 10%, 5%, whatever you agree on. Yeah. So instead of making 2% of the money in the bank, you're the bank. You can start to determine how much interest you want to come in. And if they don't pay, then you foreclose. Exactly. Get your property back. Yeah. Got, got a question online here. Um, is it a good time to consider commercial property purchases on a whole block? Um, that's an abstract question. What are you going to do? Is it for your business? Are you going to rent it out? Is it an A building? With uh, that's uh, offices is it industrial? Um, are you going to do a solar farm? You know what's that's a that's a huge question. And yes, it's a good time if it meets your criteria. Just like any situation, it's got to. Um, I don't necessarily believe in trying to time the um, the market. Make sure the terms and the situation is good for you, and then it is a good time. So the short answer is, yeah, if it's right for you, whenever whenever it's right for you, that's the good time. Absolutely, and, you know, in the good times, uh, like a lot of people, uh, there's a lot of flippers out there right now. Get like ten emails and ten texts a day from flippers. Hey. <laughs> So, you know, when they want me to do the dual agency, they want to offer me the commission on both sides and then even the commission to uh, sell it when they're ready. They offer that. Um, all I got to do is get my seller to accept $50,000 less. That's all. You know, and so they're trying to get me to break my fiduciary duty, but that happens at times. Um, yeah. Hey, Jack, Harry. Um, uh, I know who you are, man. <laughs> <laughs> a little while ago, you kind of stuck your toe on the appraiser. Um, again, <laughs> a quick little licensing question. Can somebody be a, uh, licensed as an appraiser and a renter, or is there a conflict of interest there? I think you can. You just wouldn't be able to. I've never heard of anybody doing that, um, but you more than likely wouldn't get to appraise your own deals. That would be very contradictory uh, and fiduciary duty. But um, it's such a to become an appraiser, man, they really make you want it. You oh, have yeah. to have tons of hours of internship. Um, and it can't be, you can't just knock it out, it's got to be stretched out over years. 
And so they're not offering things that Herbert's offering either. <laughs> <laughs> and so like to be an appraiser, that's it's a, like a no, we're having, we're gonna have a problem with that because the old guys are croaking out and no one wants to do it. It's like horrible. It's a horrible thing just to have some realtor mad at you, you know, staring at you, you know, <laughs> um, getting phone calls. Yeah, but. And yes, I'm uh, just curious how would it how would it be for someone to go through the the person that owns the house to do a VA loan on it? Can, can you that not a realtor? No, or, yeah, without a realtor. Yeah, I mean the, that you just would need a proper lender involved, and then that lender is gonna want title and escrow. Um, but no, you don't need a real turn ball. I don't know why you'd want to cut me out. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, no, you can do that. Hey, Jen, um, question. You just were talking about flippers. Domestic mostly, or are they foreign flippers? What really owns these people that are doing this? I don't come across that many foreigners unless they're being really slick and hiring. Uh, regular Americans, but um, I haven't seen that in the title. You know, like a lot of times it'll be an LLC or a trust or whatever. Times, um, but I haven't seen. I know that's in the news a lot. Um, these evil foreigners coming over and taking over our stuff. I haven't come across that many. I don't have any clients that are that way. Um, same same question for the cash buys. Cash buys. Um, I have come across some foreigners uh, doing that, but they're, and when I say foreigners, that means they just have an accent. Um, <laughs> I really don't. Um, and at least, at least most of the time, I don't know about all the time, I can't think of all of them, but um, it was just a regular family moving. But my prejudice is just coming out. I don't know. A couple quick ones. One is the uh, involvement of cash buys by BlackRock increasing the evil price. BlackRock. I'm sorry. And two, uh, I know independent business people that like to qualify without using the tax return. What's the best alternative? Um, you're, you got to get through your lender. Um, if you're going to get a regular loan without your tax return, I mean, that's, that's something that they are going to want, um, is your tax return because, um, the banks are not going to go through 08 again. They are, when you, next, I don't know if anybody's been cried lately or got a loan lately. Yeah. They call through your DNA now. <laughs> they make sure you are good for your loan. And so they are really going to check. They they verify and like if you're employed, they'll verify your income. Call your boss the day before it funds. And they'll do it several times. Did you still have a job? Uh, is he acting right? You know they'll tell all the questions to make sure that you're going to still be employed because they're going to take that loan and sell it to the secondary market, and it's going to end up on Wall Street some hedge fund somewhere. And those guys aren't going to take a loss either, or they're going to do everything they can to not. Um, and regarding uh, Blackwater, Blackrock, Blackhawk, all those guys, um, I haven't come across them. I know they're buying up tons of stuff. Um, I think a lot of times in San Diego, we're, we don't have the numbers that they want. Um, like in the Midwest, you could buy a house for, for 100000 and rent it out for 1000 That's a really good return on that equation. Those kind of numbers aren't around the same way. You're not going to get that kind of one percent. How do you do with mental rights? What kind of mental rights? <laughs> <I'm fantastic>. <laughs> <laughs> mineral. Mineral. mineral rights. Oh, that'll be that'll be somewhere in the deed, and that'll come up somewhere in the title, um, and that's a you might not have those rights to it. Um, it depends on what it is. If, it, if you could buy a property that has a something in the deed somewhere that says, hey, 
any kind of X minerals or you know whatever it says in there, we get or whoever uh, the beneficiary of that or who the holder of that is. And so, but if, I mean, in a normal circumstance, it's your property. Now, what are you allowed to do with your property? That's, you know, you might not be able to dig for oil, you know, in San Carlos um, or something like that. You, and that's a very, something, whatever, if there's a certain, uh, certain situation you want to get done, research it. Research it, research it, research it. I know we didn't get a chance to get to contingency period, but in your contingency period, do all your due diligence to make sure it's the property you want. Uh, make sure you can do the things you want. If you want to add a granny for that, if you want to add a second story, make sure you're allowed to. Uh, by the way, I want to make a pitch for Jack because I deal with realtors all the time. And most of them are, in I'm sorry. <laughs> I deal with realtors all the time. 90% are incompetent. Okay. They need to protect you. They need to know what they're doing. They need to fill out all the forms. I know it sounds funny. Get a competent realtor. I can't I can't tell you. I deal with them all the time and they don't know what they're doing. Go on. <laughs> and I see it on the legal end and what it came to court to get orders or you know, all kinds of stuff. So, um, what is it? They're not the same. All realtors are not the same. That's just the bottom line. Um, okay, so real quick, any more questions? I'm going to get to Yes, Susan. Okay, you're good. Okay. Just a quick question out of curiosity. I have a neighbor who has a well, and um, just curious about if. If that well is there and necessarily when you bought the property or when the property was developed. But um, how would you go about finding if you could tap into that and do the same thing yourself? Um, Your property's adjacent to their property where the well is. Yeah, that's a, I don't know where you live. That's either a city or a county. Okay. Uh, okay. You're going to have to check with them and see um, with the zoning and uh, the development and all those guys, and they're going to. You know, bless your heart. That's going to be some heavy lifting going through all those uh, people. But um, and it's all. Then you, all, you know, first thing you might want to check is how much it'll cost, because it might be. You know, I've heard of hundred thousand dollar wells. You know, it's not a. That's a lot of digging, and it's got to be done. It can't be done by some Home Depot guys. It's got to be done by you know, <laughs> folks that do that. Yeah, yeah, brother. Uh, what's a good place to do research for titles? Um, call your title, call a title rep. And if you don't have one, I, I got good ones. Um, but yeah, I, I wouldn't even try to do all that. Yeah, no, when they'll do it for, they'll do it for free and they'll do it quickly. Um, if you have that, at least they do it for me because I get um, All right, real quick, I just want to talk about contingency periods because that is super duper important. Okay, we have your, the main ones are your loan contingency, your appraisal contingency, and your inspection contingency. Obviously you can't buy the house if you don't get the loan. Um, usually it's hard written in the contract to be 17 days. You can make that any number you want. Obviously, buyers want that to be a bigger number. Sellers want that to be a smaller number. Um, the sellers want you to get through your contingency period as quick as possible so that you're locked into the deal uh, because you can cancel your agreement before your contingencies are up. Um, and so appraisal, we talked about that. If the appraisal doesn't come in, that becomes that goes back to a renegotiation state. Had an offer for 700. Appraisal came in at 650. Buyer's going to want it at 650. Seller's going to want it. At, hey, you said you wanted it at 700. So usually we negotiate it. A lot of times you just take the appraised price because now you're going to have to disclose that to the next person anyway. Um, sometimes you could do something in the middle. Sometimes there's 
back a couple of years ago, people were waiving their appraisal and saying, I'll take it and I'll pay the difference no matter what. Um, that's not as prevalent. Um, same with the inspection period. Uh, buyers have a certain amount of time, which have in the contract, to do their inspections. Is, is the roof what I think it is? Is the place on it? I've canceled as pros because people ran out of Frank Shui guy through there and the chair and the stairs weren't where they're supposed to be. And so what do you do? You can't do as a seller, you can't argue that. That's that's something that's important to them. I've even uh, uh, canceled escrow because of the color of the paint. Just so they said, what are you talking about? It's the same color paint that when you saw it. Yeah, but we didn't see it this light. Okay, well, and they can't do nothing about it. So again, sellers want a short contingency period, buyers want a longer one. The contingency period stays in effect until it's released in writing. That's a big deal. Some agents think that it is, it stays there or it, it goes away after the time period. That's what they're shooting for. It still has to be released in writing. So make sure that gets done. What you said, what gets released? The contingency periods. So, so you wait, once it's done, you put it right in the contingency and satisfied. Yeah, once the buyer and the buyer says, okay, I'm satisfied with everything. I want to go, my loan is good. Everything is good. I'm releasing my contingencies. Now, you just one point of clarity. You said if an appraisal came in lower, if an appraisal came in lower, the buyer would be willing to pay the difference. In some certain, absolutely, I've seen that at any time. I've seen that come in with an offer without a contingency for the appraisal. And they just said, we're going to pay the difference. Uh, that's not as prevalent as it was a couple of years ago, uh, but it still happens. And um, so the buyer's paying the difference. They have to pay the difference, yeah, because the bank says this is what we'll land on. Okay, they're kicking it off. Thank you so much. Let me let you guys out of the Thank you. I know we'll have it back again. Thank you so much. So now one of our classmates wrote a book. Right, Pamela Lori. Please come. Yeah. Uh, Pamela Lori Lee Lee has been 30 years in the making. It's a phenomenal story. Um, it's a trilogy. So my first book went on live on April 14th. It's called the Lydian Amazons and the Conquest of Continents. It's nonfiction. You can't make up the story, folks. And they're going to have me here to tell you about it. It's a, again, it's the first book. There's three waves of women Amazons, okay, that has not been told in history. You understand? One is 2200, 2100 BC. One is around 1300. One is about 750. They're different, but they overlap on the west coast of Turkey. So they conquered the same territory. That's why it's massive confusion, by the way. If you go to all the, what I call the traditional historians, they don't get it right, folks. And the stories, you cannot make it up. I mean, you can't make it up. You have uh, a marina in the, in the book one who conquers the continent. Have you ever heard about that? Who has 33,000 female soldiers, folks. You can't make it up. I was reading this and I thought, oh, I don't know if this is true. Well, 30 years of research, I've actually connected all the dots. It is a phenomenal story. I guarantee you will end up being a movie. I'm um, mm. getting my books out. Uh, where? Where do you buy it? You can buy it on Amazon. Just go to Female Warriors. There's a, you can actually go online. And I'm going to tell you all about it. I think go to May 7th. May 7th. Again, I can keep you entertained. I would probably be, you know, it's our story, but the, the, the little tidbits. For example, they wore snake armor. They had giant pythons in those days. You know, if you go back in history that we don't know about, but they had pythons probably 120 feet long. There was in the Congo, just so you know that it's true. In 1950s, there was a colonel, a Belgian colonel, who used to be Belgian Congo. He was flying over one of the big jungles there, and he sees a 200-foot python. He takes the picture, actually went to the CIA to say, is this, you know, is this for real? So... There are, they had, you know, like it, it, it turns into what they call creole, the French have where you boil the leather and it becomes hard as steel. They had, you just, you listen, they, you just can't make it up. You, and so, one of the part of the problem is this is it's five and a half paragraphs from the Otters of Sicily. And uh, you, you say, okay, 
me just go backtrack. I did wave two and wave three, and then I had a friend call me name of law. He says, come on, you can't have wave two and wave three without one part. I said, well, I don't know what's going on in 2200 BC. You know, I don't know what I ate for breakfast yesterday. You know, And so she says, no, no, do it. And it became absolutely fascinating. There was an emergent leader called Marina. Um, I explained how she probably came to power because there's Tinhana, there's some extra sure, female warriors during the, the uh, Arab conquest that were emergent leaders. So there's some history of how they would they would rise in the ranks. She's probably a, a, like a, a shaman. Then at some critical point, she became the leader. And uh, how much is your book? It's I think it's like 1895, something like that. It's it's it's, it's nothing. You can buy it also on Kindle. But the point is, is that there's a whole history that we don't even know about. Um, you know, it brings in pharaohs. Like, for example, there's a pharaoh who goes by one designation called Horus. And I have to tell you, I rack my brains because that designation leaves at the third, third dynasty. And so you say, well, how is this possible? You got to read the book. There's a solution. It's a phenomenal story, folks. I'm excited to tell you about it. And I'm already working on the book, too, that's written. And we're bucking that up for publication. So thank you. Okay, so we'll see you uh, next week, and our speaker next week is Tim. And any prayer requests, by the way, anybody want to lift anybody up? I have some seniors in nursing homes that I want to lift up. Okay. My God, Michelle. Michelle, okay. And next week we have James. James. James Anderson, and he'll be speaking. Disabled uh, people. Oh, disabled. Yep, that's my name. <laughs> All right, let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for each one of the people here today, Lord. And I lift up Michelle to you, Lord. You know her needs, and you know the family's desires, Lord. I pray that your hand is just touching her life right now, Lord. I pray for anybody who didn't show up today, Lord. Just bring them to our class. I pray that people are uh, brought to your full wisdom, Lord, and that your hand is just guiding each one of us daily as we make decisions, Lord. Help us to keep our eyes focused on you and help us to walk that clear, focused path. Pray for Skyline Church tonight and today, Lord, going forward. I know there's a lot of new believers, and I just pray that each one of them will just be invested in your word. And I'm praying for the young people. They're having the six o'clock um, young people gathering again here at Skyline. And I just pray that that grows. And I pray for each one of us this week as we go forward in our business plans and just touch each one of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Yeah, a lot of young people at Skyline, six o'clock. I hear they have a good service. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right. How are you doing?